Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Foundation Center. Welcome to those who are online. Um, we um, are happy to be doing this program today. It's um, about the evolving nature of nonprofit and corporate partnerships, and uh, you'll have the uh, honor of, of hearing some really best practices from uh, Tipping Point and Canal Alliance, and I'll introduce these folks in just a minute. Um, my name is Rachel Grossman, and um, before we start, I want to just mention a couple rules of the road for these events, um, just to respect the fact there's people in the room as well as people watching on the live stream. Um, please silence your cell phones for those who are in the room, and uh, just to give you a sense, we're, this is up to a 90-minute program. Uh, the, close to the first hour of it will be a conversation between us on the panel, um, and then we will open up to your questions. And we strongly encourage you to ask questions. This is a great opportunity to ask, ask about issues that are bubbling up. That said, uh, this is what we call a pitch-free zone, which means anything that's specific to your, your organization is probably too close to a pitch. So just be careful about asking questions in the public setting that will be of interest to fo fo other folks as well. Um, We'll set aside 20 to 30 minutes at the end, so there'll be plenty of time. When we do that, I'll have people in the room come up to the podium mic over here to ask their questions so that everyone can hear them, including those who are on the live stream audience. Um, and uh, the live stream audience is also very encouraged to ask questions. Those will be gathered and brought up here to the podium. So just the logistics of this, and uh, it works all quite well. Um, so a little context setting today. Um, corporate and nonprofit partnerships are a very big part of the world of the social sector today. And in the past decade, they've definitely evolved um, from something that was much more about just direct uh, checkbook, check writing, to something that is much more strategic and integrated um, for many reasons. And you'll hear a lot of them today. Um, from my own experience, having been both a corporate executive and a nonprofit executive managing partnerships, I, I saw it from all sides, and now I consult and coach folks who are doing this. Uh, and on the corporate side, companies started developing more than just a bottom line. They care much more about environmental and social issues and need to work closely with social sector organizations in order to address those. And then on the, on the nonprofit side, there's been a real push for people to be much more business smart in their operations. And you will hear lots of good information regarding that today. Um, so uh, the folks that we have here are some of the, if you can come on into the center, that'd be great. Um, the folks we have here are some of the best, best practices you'll hear. The Kelly Bathgate runs the corporate partnerships for the Tipping Point community. And I'll, I'll let Kelly and Omar introduce themselves in just a minute. And Omar Carrera is the, ED of the Canal Alliance, which is based in Marin. Um, they have been a tipping point grantee for up to 10 years now, which is remarkable to hear, and their work has evolved over those 10 years, and he's going to talk a little bit about that, as has the way that tipping point has approached this work. And um, so we will um, be talking about a few different levels. One is sort of trends and, and general shifts in this realm. Um, uh, a look at what makes these partnerships successful, both on a strategy level as well as logistics. And then finally, how these are connected, how these partnerships are really connected to the other aspects of the work that the nonprofits do. Um, so with that, um, I want to just ask one quick question of the audience in the room. If you can just identify sort of your interest in this, how many are work with nonprofits? If you just raise your hands. Okay. Are there any folks that work with companies that do partnerships? Okay. Uh, any consultants who work on this? Okay. And finally, anybody in the philanthropy realm who works in this realm? So most of, it sounds like most of you are in the nonprofit side of the, of the okay, good to know. All righty. Um, with that, let's get started. Um, I'm going to ask both Kelly and Omar to introduce themselves. Come on in and come to the center if you wouldn't mind, just so it'll be easier for everybody to hear. Um, uh, to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about your, how you got into this work personally, but then how about your organizations and sort of the big context of the work that your organizations each do. Would you like to start, Kelly? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Kelly Bathgate. I um, head up our partnerships and what we call management assistance work at Tipping Point. Management assistance is basically 
our jargon for um, the capacity building support we provide. Uh, I've been at Tipping Point for about six, actually six years this month, um, which is crazy. Um, and for a little bit of background, so Tipping Point is a Bay Area focused foundation um, here in San Francisco that is focused um, specifically on fighting poverty in the Bay Area. So it's very local and regional. We work in the six major um, Bay Area counties. And our model, a few things that distinguish our model, we give um, general operating support to grantees. We have 44 um, grantee organizations right now um, working in the areas of education, employment, housing, and wellness. Um, in addition to an annual grant that we give every year, um, we provide what we call management assistance or capacity building support. So we work closely with the leadership of our grantee organizations to determine where their biggest needs are. And then we use um, our networks and resources to find, res um, to find um, partners that can help meet those needs. Um, often those are corporations, sometimes they're other um, uh, paid providers or other um, consultants or independent folks in the, in the area that have specialty expertise. Um, let's see, what else? How did you come it? to this work? How did I come to this work? Um, my background's in education reform. So I actually um, started out uh, teaching um, in East Palo Alto in a community organization um, and then got into a little bit of the development and fundraising side and worked a lot um, with foundations doing the asking um, and then um, was always really interested in sort of how institutions work together and, and kind of the role of the public sector, the private sector, the philanthropic sector, and nonprofit to kind of solve our society's biggest problems, poverty <laughs> being one of them. Um, and so just uh, decided to make the switch. Tipping Point is the, is the first um, uh, philanthropic role I've had. Omar, how about you? Hello, everyone. My name is Omar Carrera. I'm the executive <coughs> director of Canal Alliance. We are a Marin County-based organization. This year, we are celebrating 35 years of existence. Our primary goal is to help the immigrant community escape the generational cycle of poverty. We use education as the main tool to achieve that. And we have a very holistic approach to help people deal with the symptoms of poverty, because they're still living in poverty around education, healthcare, transportation, employment, housing. And, and, and the goal is to help kids graduate from a four-year college and adults to become bilingual and be part of the workforce right now in the county. Um, my personal story is I, w I was one of the two million Ecuadorians that were forced to leave the country after the crisis in 1999 with all our money disappeared. Um, the people responsible for that are living in this country with asylum, and the money they were stolen are in U.S. banks. So um, prior to that, I was a consultant for Mitsubishi. My background, I'm a CPA and a business manager. Uh, my job was to help businesses increase performance. So I was not planning to come to this country, but I was lucky to have my wife is from here, from the Bay Area, and, and we just decided to move after that crisis. Um, I was a client of Canal Alliance in 2004. I was taking ESL classes. I didn't speak English back then. And with all the support that they provided, um, I was able to fall in love with the concept of what a nonprofit is. And it was um, very refreshing to see how many skills and, and tools that we use in the for profit can actually be transferred to a nonprofit. And that's how I developed my new career and doing the same thing in helping a nonprofit to enhance performance but now for the better, better mission, so. Great, thank you. Um, Kelly, can you give us a little bit of sense of sort of trends in corporate giving and how it's shifted over the years um, from just, you know, from beyond the checkbook to a much more comprehensive approach and sort of what companies are looking at and what companies are active, you know, just sure. land the land would be helpful. Um, I'll, I'll speak specifically about the Bay Area, which obviously we're an industry town, and so I know a lot about the tech industry um, and their giving trends, um, and then we can kind of extrapolate from there. Um, so Tipping Point has an initiative called SF Gives. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's basically a um, consortium of, I think, 24 um, mainly tech companies, some other, I think we have some banks, JP Morgan, Levi's, some outliers, but the majority of the organization, of the companies are um, in the tech sector. Um, and through that, we put out kind of a, a 
corporate social responsibility playbook and did a lot of research around kind of trends um, on giving in that area. I think particularly with tech, when you have companies that have a big product that can potentially help nonprofits, um, you see a lot of giving, but the majority of it's going to be in kind. So when we, we put this um, out probably two years ago now, so the, this data is probably about three years old, but um, overall in the, the tech sector is, is giving about $5.5 billion dollars. Um, to back into the nonprofit sector, into the community, um, only about one billion of that is in cash. So the great majority of the support that um, companies are giving, at least in this region, is either through donations, whether that's product or service, um, as well as um, kind of in kind, um, I guess in kind more like on the service side. And that, it's interesting. So that that's monetarily valued, but one could argue um, uh, the consistency with which those those uh, services and products are are valued across different companies. Um, I, in in my experience in my working here in this area over the last six years, I think companies are really um, stepping up their engagement in the community. And when we ask kind of the why, it's um, you know typically you often hear a lot of PR reasons. You want it, especially in a very competitive market like the tech sector here in the Bay Area. You want to kind of stand out, um, if there is a business, you know, if you do, if you're Salesforce and you do want nonprofits using your product, there's definitely a business impact. The one that we hear a lot is also from the employee impact. So obviously, we're in an incredibly um, competitive labor market right now, and particularly um, as companies are trying to recruit millennials, we've heard um, that. Uh, people are looking for companies that are very engaged in their communities, both from a, what they're giving monetarily, or product or service, but also opportunities to um, volunteer and get involved with the community. So I think that there is um, both business and kind of people impact that organ that companies are, are really looking to hit um, through their through their uh, social impact work. There'll be some more questions on that later, I'm guessing. Um, so Omar, get talk, can you talk about how sort of how you view corporate partnerships and how it's evolved? When we were on the phone, you talked about the, how it had shifted from before 2008 and the financial mm -hmm. crisis to how you approach them now and what that's been like for Canal Alliance. Sure. Um, before 2008, oh, the corporate giving for us is one of the, the we actually get more money from program fees from clients than mm -hmm. corporations. And, and that was a struggle for us. And, and also, I think it was a trend across, um, not just in the county, but across the Bay Area, maybe in the nation, that the new, the, phil the, the philanthropic strategies that the corporations had now was driven by the employees. It used to be a relationship with the CEO, you call them, you wanna make a donation, and, and it took place. But now it was driven by the employees. So the whole employment engagement programs are actually built in with volunt volunteerism. And, and, and they create their own committees, and they decide where the money should go. So that changed the way how, uh, th that changed the way, how, the way we partner with organizations, now directly with the CEO, but now with the employees. Now, after the 2008 crisis, it changed the conversation. It used to be uh, focused on just, just because you do good is good enough, here's our support in, in dollars, but now that, uh, that changed. Now doing good was not good enough. They wanna see, uh, if I'm sending you a group of employees to your, uh, to your organization, what type of impact are we creating in the community? So it was, they were asking for more information and not necessarily give you more resources. And, and we were actually struggling trying to create all these volunteer opportunities for these companies that were reaching out. Hey, we want to help. I have a, a group of people of 20 that want to go and volunteer in your food bank. And it's only so many people that you can put in your food bank. And, and you know, and, and not necessarily translated to a, don a financial donation after that. It was just creating an engagement at the individual level. So that's what we decided to change a little bit. You know, okay, it's great to get this corporate support for services, but we changed the focus of Canal Alliance. Uh, six years ago, we made the decision that we don't wanna be just focusing on helping people deal with the symptoms of poverty. We wanna help people escape poverty. And we have a strong belief around why is that we do that. So we wanna make sure now that our corporate partners are aligned with it. You know, just providing services is great but we really want to help people escape poverty. And as I mentioned, 
we can use a lot of the tools and knowledge that the corporate sector have, and they have the resources for it. So we are also creating opportunities for them to come and help us build capacity, not just at the service side, but build capacity in, the, in our own infrastructure. So I'm happy to share some yeah, examples absolutely. of that. absolutely. Lots of examples would be good. Sure. Yeah. You know, the Salesforce and the, and the work with data management. Yeah, so many nonprofits after the 2008 crisis, it was, you know, everything that we were calling about Alcan. I actually enrolled myself back in school because I thought it was a translation issue that I was having, the way how <laughs> how foundations were describing an outcome and so nonprofits describing outcome and everybody's talking about impact and, and and it was complicated for me to understand that. So I went back to school, I enrolled myself in one of the executive programs at Harvard University uh, around performance measurements. So after that training, six months training, I came back and said it was not a translation issue. <laughs> it was, <laughs> It was really a, a problem around across the industry that we don't have a key standards to measure performance, right? And the meaning is different from organization to organization. Increase impact, what does that mean? Uh, even a referral, what does the referral mean? For some organizations, like here's a piece of paper, go and they're gonna help you. For other organizations, meant I'm gonna walk with you to the other organization to make sure that you receive services. But when you just pay attention to the data, is both organizations are making referrals. One is making 5,000 referrals, the other one is making 100 referrals. So philanthropy and our corporate partners were measuring uh, this organization is more efficient because it's making 5,000 referrals and you're only making 100. So developing a new system um, that allowed us to actually tell our story, that required a lot of the, the, the knowledge the nonprofits didn't have that before. The understanding of what an outcome was, imagine what it is to map all your business processes and understand how the client flow goes in your organization and choose a CRM tool that's gonna be the right tool for the agency. And most importantly, make sure that everybody is excited about adopting that new tool and having the resources in-house to provide all the administrative support that that new tool actually will require. For a non-profit that has not, found, not planned to spend $80,000, $100,000 in that year. So that's how corporate partners can play a role to help you, not just with providing you the licenses, like Salesforce in that case, they provide a discount license for nonprofits, but before that, who's providing that support? So there are all institutions they believe, like Tipping Point, they believe in the importance of capacity building. Because without that infrastructure, how can you create the impact that you're planning to have? So we were lucky to have Tipping Point as a partner in this process they connect us with the right consultants to help us understand this is the roadmap. The, if you want to create a CRM that makes sense for you, this is what you have to do. And it's a lot of the homework that you have to do first before you engage in a relationship with a consultant. So, so talk a little more about the detail, what it means to have a CRM. And, uh, does everybody know what a CRM is, contact relationship? Can yeah. Can you ask him what CRM is? Yes. Yeah, CRM is. So it's a content fine. relationship management or contact relationship management is, is a data is a more sophisticated database. They allow you to understand not just how many people have you served, but what is the interactions and what are the correlations among all the services that you provide to create a particular impact. You use Salesforce, right? We use Salesforce, yes. So give some examples of what you actually track in Salesforce then and how that came about. Because right. that's a that's part of the tipping point support, sure. right? So our story is we are right now in our second instance of Salesforce, right? The, and, the first, the first company we partnered with them to to implement the database was a good example of a failed partnership. I would say right. it was not successful at first, right? No, it was not, it, <laughs> and I think it was the responsibility the all parties involved in that, including our own responsibility, but not understanding. <laughs> we were ha having idea about what is it we're trying to accomplish high level. Mm -hmm but we were not clear about how to get there. And we were not clear about what is our logic model and outcomes and metrics that you need to pay attention to actually get there. We just thought, and we were not having a very good uh, collaboration among our, our departments. So we thought if we would just bring a technology tool, it would resolve all our problems. <laughs> and as you know, technology just enables you the work that you're trying to accomplish. It's not gonna fix your problems. So if you have collaboration issues, if you had not resolved those issues uh, among teams, the technology tool is not gonna do it for you. So we just jumped to the conclusion that we bring a tool and it's gonna do all work. So yes, we were collecting now information in one place. That really was very helpful, but still it was not telling us the story that we needed. 
and so was not creating the collaboration that we planned. So the design, it was an issue around the design, and that was what the failure was, is that we jumped to the conclusion that we need a system without understanding about the design and getting more involved in that, in that process. So we have a consultant that also I think was part of the responsibility, because I was a consultant before, and my job is not to come and tell you what are your problems, is, is helping you ask tough questions or have questions for you to identify yourself, what is the, the problems that you have and what are the potential solutions for it. We just came somebody to say, hey, we need a system, no problem, I build it for you. <laughs> and then the response later was like, well, you asked me to build that. But, like, but that's your job to ask me the right questions to make sure because you know, we didn't have clear business uh, maps and we didn't have that in place how can you actually go and build that? You know, so it didn't make sense. And the tipping point was, you know, uh, con the tipping point connect us with this consultant company because they work in a portfolio basis and they would like to work with all the, all the clients with the same consultant. So I think that's what we are sharing the responsibility around that is that none of us did enough work to decide how this new system would look like. And I think as a funder, we, we were pushing it. We, we kind of pushed you to work with this provider because we had someone there building out system, database systems for various grantees. And we, um, I think, underestimated the amount of strategy and planning that needed to go on before that. Um, and, you know, to be honest, like jump the gun a little bit. So. Yeah. So I have a feeling this is a question that's relevant for a lot of people in the audience. How do you get the, your staff to start working <laughs> together in a way that would support this? Because... It's, you're right, technology won't solve that problem. How did you get people yeah. enthusiastic about collaborating? <laughs> yeah, it was, definitely was not about cell phones. So yeah. we, we solved that. Um, we actually understood very quickly that that was not a problem. It really was to see, understand, what is our contributions to help people escape poverty? Before um, philanthropy, it was, it was funding uh, nonprofits to think about programs and services, right? So you have a particular grant to give you specific money to do a specific activity. Um, we have foundations that were supporting us, um, activities related with giving food away to people. And people thought themselves that that's my job. My job was not to help people escape, po escape poverty. And they didn't quite understood how that activity was connected to uh, the ultimate goal that we have as an agency. So we had to go and embrace a cultural change. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's one, one of the most complicated and challenges uh, tasks for any organization is to start embracing a cultural change around it. Uh, the, everybody is aligned to achieve the same goal. Mm -hmm. right? and, and once we are aligned on that, I think collaboration starts happening naturally okay. versus us forcing you to collaborate. You actually find out yourselves a, now I need to interact with the immigration legal services team because I have a client that could have been a benefit for that particular service. Or I have a client now that has a kid that potentially can benefit from the after school program. So the collaboration was happening because everybody understood why is it we're trying to accomplish as an organization. Okay, so if I'm understanding it's helping people shift from focusing on the activities they were doing to the outcomes of right. those activities. Right. And that Salesforce was a, a tool to allow you to track? Not the first instance. Not the first time, okay. Not the first time. So, yeah, so you were doing, that was focused what, on the activities then, not the exactly. outcomes? Uh -huh. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So the second instance, then we understood Deeping Point, Canal Alliance, we understood what the process should be, and we engaged with a new partner they help us go through that process. But before that, we spent almost a year really understanding what policies, what processes, the flow of our clients, the collaboration has gonna take place. And then we found the partner that can help us design a system that will enable us to do that. Okay. And that's what we have now. Okay, so can you build on that and some of the le learnings, Kelly, from what didn't work and what did work and how you brought corporate support in to help Make that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest learning for us in that, um, like I said, we had a partner that we were um, helping do database implementation for a variety of grantees, and I think um, a couple things. One, we would kind of connect them and walk away and not necessarily be as rigorous as I think we are now about checking in on how the process is going, both with the partner and um, with our grantee organization. And then, like I said, I think we were pushing that as a solution, hoping that it would kind of like solve all problems without really understanding. Um, deeply some of the, the bigger 
kind of strategy shifts, cultural shifts that needed to happen in order to get to the final outcomes. I think particularly um, in this area, we have so many companies um, and we're very fortunate to be connected to a lot of uh, big companies that want to give their product. And by working with Tipping Point, they can kind of get it broadly out to many um, very awesome nonprofit organizations in the area. Um, and so it was it's easy to say yes to everything. And then our job is to like put it onto our grantees, basically. And so I think over the years, because of this and other examples, we've really learned um, that it's OK to say no, and that it's OK to like slow down and step back. And in fact, that is our role and value add to the corporations of kind of helping um, navigate or translate um, kind of some of the like cultural differences between nonprofits and corporations. And so you might be pushed to go at a certain speed. Um, and th it's our job to kind of say that's not going to that's not going to be most effective for the nonprofit organizations if that's the case. Okay. So I mean, I think we've got a lot of learnings from it. And are there other examples about the sort of cultural divide between corporations and, and nonprofits that you've had to manage? Um, well, yeah, that's, yeah. that's my entire job. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we work with a lot of big, um, um, uh, a lot of our pro bono support comes from kind of big corporate, um, I think of like the strat management consulting um, companies. We work with McKinsey, Deloitte, um, Boston Consulting Group. We've had very successful engagements through that, and we have had very challenging engagements as well. Um, and I think where we've landed is that now when we have an engagement like that, we have someone from our from our team on the partnerships team at Tipping Point kind of be sitting in and acting as sort of like a co-consultant along with that team, really to help. Um, what we have found is that our, our, our uh, staff from our grantee organizations are um, very grateful for getting like very important and valuable services and so it's very hard for them to give feedback that hey this isn't exactly what I need or you're not quite understanding our model or, you don't really understand our target population and it was hard to ha kind of have very um, explicit and direct conversations at times when things needed to be course corrected and we come in and we kind of say to corporations look if you partner with us we're going to help you do that and so then that, we've set it up that that's actually my role is to give you feedback when you're not when you're missing the mark um, and so just being a little bit more engaged in that way um, and then just being brutally honest in much the same way you would if you're paying them $500,000 or whatever, a Fortune 100 company pays them for their services. Um, and we have found that that, I mean, A, it gets, most importantly, it gets to a better product for our grantee organizations. Um, but then, I, you know, probably equally importantly, I think that that is why companies seek us out to work through us because they, I mean, they want to be as effective and as impactful as possible. It's just sometimes hard to do that with a pro bono model. So, um, Countless examples of, of that for sure. Actually, if you could give a couple more besides Salesforce, if there's other examples that would be, or it don't outside of Canal Alliance potentially. Um, sure. Let me think. Um, so we worked with a company to do kind of a technology, not a technology donation, but a technology assessment and strategy for an organization. And this is a company that has a lot of experience in working with you know Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies. Um, how you're going to assess like enterprise level technology is going to be very different than how you're going to assess it for um, a nonprofit organization. We have a grantee, um, a kind of college access and college success grantee organization um, that wanted to do this. They were um, now in kind of, I think, four or five sites nationally and really needed to work on their technology to allow sites to communicate together, to allow knowledge management, to just have the communications and kind of the full suite of, of um, technology that supports their work in multiple regions. So we got um, we got this this company to come in and do this assessment, um, and I think, uh, man, we really tried to set it up for success from the very beginning because we'd already had another example where it hadn't gone well and they just didn't quite translate um, um, work that they do in the corporate sector for the nonprofits. But we. We sat in. We tried to we tried to set expectations of, of how the organization was different, what their resources were, and I shall say that this this nonprofit is um, relatively an incredibly well resourced nonprofit, but still there's a huge difference. Um, and so they were given um, kind of assessment of current state and then like a strategy. Okay, so to improve your technology over the next year, these are the things that you should do. This is how you should prioritize it. Here's your plan. Here's your roadmap. And um, I think so. And then the engagement ended. It was, you know, a four-week consulting engagement or something like that. And um, I get a call from our from our grantee organization saying, "Hey, 
we have this basically like PowerPoint deck um, with a, a, a strategy laid out and no way to actually implement it. Um, and so I think um, what was underestimated is the end product for um, a company that has an entire IT staff and, and an entire budget and you know all these resources to actually get it done is very different than what that looks like for a nonprofit organization who may not have even an I, like an internal IT person, no less an entire team or staff. And so the level of detail that needs to go into a quote unquote implementation plan or that really needs um, uh, to get from like a really nice strategy that can sit on the shelf forever um, to actually informing um, operations and changing the way this, this uh, nonprofit kind of set up their infrastructure was just at an entirely different level. So we had to go back in and then provide additional implementation support. And I think that that's also a lesson that we've learned across the board regardless of whether you know, it's a program design or a technology strategy or, you know, talent issues is that the level of implementation support, particularly when we're getting the initial kind of um, uh, strategy from, a, from, a, from someone that typically supports companies has to be at a, a far more detailed um, level. And so we often do just continued follow-on support. And I think, I mean, I think the um, database implementation example is a good one of that, is that we realized we had to go back in, do a, do a theory of change, and then basically kind of go through the whole process again mm -hmm. at a much more detailed level. So outside of the realm of technology, you've told me some stories, Omar, about non-technology partnerships. One was the Secrets of the Rich and the work with the banks. It'd be good to hear some non-technology. I mean, I'm not sure everybody here is looking at massive technology build-outs, but that was a great example of a partnership that you managed and shifted. Right. So or bank partners, you know, they are interested to come and give you some money as part of the Community Reinvestment Act. So they have the responsibility to do something with that mm -hmm. fund in the community. But the way they plan to do it is go to organizations like Canal Alliance and say, hey, we're gonna give you a $5,000 check, but we would like to come and provide some financial education to the community. And in the beginning, we said, that sounds like a great idea. Why not <laughs> just give it a try? And we were talking about credit and the kinds the, you know, the employees from the bank so that was another component is the employees were going to be doing these volunteer uh, activities. So that was exciting, you know, giving opportunities to the, the staff to be part of something great. And they came to the classroom and they dumped you 100 pages of information around credit, you know, now uh, and expecting that people will understand. And at the end, they will come and give you some business card. By the way, if you need a bank account or savings account, here's my business card. So. Is that what we really want to accomplish as, as an organization? How is that really helping people escape poverty? So we, we had to change the, the, the conversation with the banks. So like, is the $5,000 worth for us to do this? This is not making any sense. Mm -hmm. So we proposed back to them, this is what we're going to do. Financial education is important, but we're going to call it the secrets of the rich. Uh, and there's going to be some concepts around credit or savings. And you're going to invest on that, but we are the ones providing the curriculum and training. So in some banks said, no, we want to do it. That's, you know, or opportunity to connect with potential clients. Other banks say, no, I'm interested more about the outcome of that. So here's my money, and here's some resources for your staff to actually um, use as a content, right? So I think that's, that was one of the examples. There are some corporations they are not gonna be aligned with what you're trying to do, All right? So that's my job as a leader to make sure that they, the partners are aligned with <clears> the vision, the principles, what is it we're trying to accomplish. And in some cases, it's not gonna work, and that's okay. But for us, we have a clear idea of what is it we're trying to, com to, to um, achieve at the end of the day. And any partner, any volunteer, or any um, employee that we hire has to be aligned with that. Was it hard to say no? I mean, you always have to say no to five thousand dollars, but um, but I think it was the right decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's something you actually help nonprofits with: is learning when they say yes and when they say no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's been a big learning for us, as I mentioned with the other the the kind of database implementation example. But um, I think there is a power dynamic between um, corporations and nonprofits that is just not helpful for either party. Um, and it's this, you know, um, kind of nonprofits tend to be 
really focused on bringing more resources into their into their organizations, whether it's in kind donations or cash, um, and and corporations, whether they're providing services or whether that off, often you know our partners are also donors, and so it comes along with cash. And so we um, see our nonprofit grantees like bend over backwards, trying to court essentially these these corporations, doing things. You are the best. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, doing things thinking that they're going to get the financial investment. And they may, they may or may not, but um, if it's not, as Omar was saying, if it's not connected to what their, their core program or what their mission is, then um, it's it often, in my opinion, is a waste of resources. Because, I mean, for, especially like for, for $5,000, for $10,000, for $15,000, the amount of, of staff capacity and time that are going into like organizing, whether it's a volunteer event or right-sizing a project that you got pro bono, but really if you just paid that amount, you know, you, you would have been much more efficient. And so I um, often am coaching our, our uh, staff at our grantee organizations to really think about, okay, what is this going to bring in the door, but also importantly, what it's going to cost you. And there's always, always, always a cost, even for like the best, most amazing pro bono whatever, there's going to be a cost for your organization. And so we often um, uh, just make sure people are going through that that thought exercise to make sure it's worth it. And then on the flip side, I'd say, um, particularly, I, I said the volunteer event, I and mean, we, we get so many times our partners or our board members, companies will call and say, I have 50 people, it's, it's, it's December, and I have 50 people, and I want them to volunteer, and you know this well. Um, and you know, find me a great, not, we want to go help. <laughs> and and um, again, to the point of saying no. Uh, we sit in a relatively lucky position because we're in an intermediary, but there's responsibility that comes with that too. So we kind of look at it as it's our responsibility to do some education around this and actually like sending a hundred of your best intended employees to go help, I don't know, uh, stock the gift closet during the holidays or something like that is potentially not the most impactful thing that you could do on the one side. And on the other, if there is a, a nonprofit organization that's doing that, it's costing them a lot to put this on for you. And so we really um, have advised our corporate partners, if you, A, try to think of something that might be in smaller groupings or that is actually really core to what the organization needs, and we can help them do that. And then B, if you do a very big event where clearly it's taking a lot of energy on the part of the nonprofit, um, to, to match that time gift with an actual financial gift to make it um, worth their while. Can you speak, Omar, to how you've ma learned to manage these partnerships and what it, you've figured out it's taken? Because it, they do take resources. So. Sure. I think it's, you know, if I can summarize with mm -hmm. three key things, is one of them is really clarity right, uh, mm -hmm. about what is the you trying to achieve. Also, think about these partners. They have their own needs. They have their own uh, uh, goals they want to achieve, right? Uh, yes, they are great people and they want to have a local impact, but as a company, as a business, they have their own priorities. Why is it they do that? So take it as an interview process, you know. Uh, why is it you want to do this? Mm. And, and have that clarity. If there is alignment about what you as an organization are trying to do and what they want to do, then is like um, is the recipe for, for success mm -hmm. because you start at that level first, um, and I think you have to be very intentional too. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be intentionality. Yes, you can send me twenty people to help at the food bank, but are we doing this more for you to feel good that you help the poor, or are you really invested in helping families to have a better life? Right? What is that? What is the people are coming to? And we use other opportunities to train these people with the issues that we are uh, involved. Because these are the, we are seeing them as potential donors too, right, mm -hmm. as individuals. They come into us. They are potential donors. They have the capacity to influence policy, either with their votes during elections or call the local uh, authorities, right? So there is, is, a, is a world of opportunities if we are very intentional when we receive these groups. Um, but also we want to say, okay, you come, you're helping, but are you willing to uh, walk the extra mile and help us fundraise $1,000 for these families? And then you can see a lot of the groups will say, oh, no, that's not what we want to do. We went. So, but there's some groups that say, yeah, help me how. Help, help me understand how I can do that. And one example is we have a biotech company that was trying to send employees to do some work in the community, and they came and they work, and, 
And when I was interviewing some of the, the, the staff that came to talk, it was this woman who was from Puerto Rico. She, she was a, a, a soccer player and a scientist. So she was very passionate about the work that we do because we, we primarily focus on the Latino community. So for her, it was very important to do that work to help other girls fall in love with, with, with school and, and maybe soccer and have the same opportunities that she had. So when I told her about coming on a Tuesday and giving food away, perhaps it's not going to uh, be enough to achieve that. So she became a tutor of the program. And she was providing support to the kids, academic support to the students. And then she fell in love with the, with the, with the, with the, with the students. And then she came and said, Omar, I want to do more. Well, and I said, here's an idea. And you take it from here. What are we doing? I know that she was a soccer player. So said, well, we don't organize a soccer event. <laughs> and all that money can go to the scholarship fund that we have. And that was it. You know, the next thing is she took it home coordinate the soccer event, and we have almost 100 people coming to uh, play one day soccer event, and we fundraised like $1,500. So it didn't cost us anything to do that, and now we have another 50 new donors in our donor base, and that's how you build the relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, clarity, alignment, and intentionality in anything that you do, I think, is crucial. Yeah, and now how about your own staff? Have, have you had designated staff working on these partnerships then? We have, uh, we have a development team, mm -hmm. and we have a volunteer, a person that focus on the volunteer opportunities, and we have another staff that focus on the corporate and institutional mm -hmm. uh, partnerships. Okay. So among those two, they share responsibilities and managing those relationships. Okay, good. Um, Kelly, can you give a little broader sense of Tipping Point's work? Because I know corporate partnerships are a big part of obviously what you do, but mm -hmm. what the organization does, but you do a lot more and it'd be nice to get the sort of whole ecosystem of how you work with grantees. Sure. Um, so yeah, corporate partnerships is one piece of the support that we provide. Like I said um, in, in my opening, a few key distinguishers of the model is um, the general operating support that we provide and the level of due diligence that we do um, for organizations to bring to bring nonprofits into our grant making portfolio um, I think kind of stands out but for, for better or worse um, um, we have an entire we have a team of program officers that are doing um, research within our communities to figure out um, where we want to invest and, and what's going to kind of match um, our existing portfolio to increase our impact um, on the on the capacity building support, so we have partnerships where we'll come in and do one on one engagements, and I think that's that's very important work. In addition, we offer um, a whole series of workshops and professional development trainings um, for staff at grantee organizations uh, throughout the year. So we offer about thirty five of those a year. It ends up being um, we kind of take July and August off, so it ends up being at least once um, a week. And those range on topics from um, kind of recruiting, talent issues, um, board and governance. Um, we offer it to um, uh, incoming board members on kind of how to, like board, board governance 101. Um, we offer a workshop on corporate partnerships. Uh, everything that you can imagine from kind of direct service, um, mental health type stuff, legal needs, Talent, basically every element that you can think of in, an, in a nonprofit organization, we offer training around that. Um, we also uh, facilitate a board placement program, and that's actually a big way for us. It's, it's um, in many ways self-serving, although we do hear from our grantees, it's one of the more helpful things that um, we can do when we place a strong board member, which is why we're following it up with training as well. Um, but we have... Um, you know, one of the things our corporations want are to give their employees opportunities to really engage deeply. It's sometimes that's a volunteer opportunity, and other times people are really kind of at the stage in their life and career where they want to um, where they want to volunteer more deeply. And obviously, board membership, board um, participation is sort of the biggest uh, uh, volunteer opportunity one can take on. I think with nonprofits, um, so we through our partnerships and just through our networks in general vet um, potential board candidates and then match them with our grantee organizations um, uh, and place somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 of, of those people a year and then follow up with training and help them, you know, kind of learn how to fundraise and learn how to be effective right off the bat. Um, let's see, what am I forgetting? Uh, we've recently, more on the on the programmatic side, it's, um, some of you might have, might have heard in the 
local press lately. Um, we've recently gotten into systems change work as well. So in addition to the direct um, uh, core grant making that we do with direct service organizations, we're just beginning to um, think about how we can um, invest philanthropic support in a smart way into um, public systems. So right now, we're working on chronic homelessness in San Francisco, which was just a big announcement. Um, but again, tr thinking about how we can leverage the flexibility that we have as a philanthropic funder to um, um, kind of change and improve uh, systems that are that are um, really affecting issues that we're working on. Thank you. This is a, a little bit of a, a new question, but um, I imagine a lot of people in the room are from smaller organizations than Canal mm -hmm. Alliance, and I'd love for you to sort of think out loud about how this translates for small or organizations with that probably I'm don't sorry, have the I budget. Really this, but can you just say what is your budget, just to get an idea of how big you are? Uh, uh, five million. Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining there are other folks in the room with smaller budgets. Am I correct in that assumption? Um, so I'd just love for you to think out loud about how this translates to a smaller organization. And some of what you've described, I would imagine, does. But you know, you d you're not everybody has a systems-oriented um, IBM consultant. <laughs> On their uh, leading the organization, so you know, h how do you translate this for smaller groups? And do you have small grantees? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think um, our we have a very big range. So I think our um, smallest smallest budget grantee has I think a six hundred thousand annual yeah. budget, and then our largest we work with some charter management organizations that have like fifty sixty million dollar. Um, so it's a big range. Yeah. <laughs> so how would you? Tr I mean, for folks and I'm. You know, I don't want to jump the gun with your questions, but I'm <coughs> assuming people, I'm imagining people are thinking, well, how does this translate for me with a small, you know, bootstrap organization? Um, so is there any way that you would, that sort of advice you'd give to smaller organizations about how to think about this? Sure. I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for all of us. Uh, we are a $5 million organization, but it's still most of the money that we receive are grants for services. Uh, we have only, tipping point is the only, a founder, they actually give us money for capacity building. Mm -hmm. So it's still a struggle for many organizations. So the smaller you are, the more complicated it is. Mm -hmm. For us, what we have been able to do is really changing our relationship with our corporate partners. Um, I mean, going back to technology, mm -hmm. just because it's a good example around that, a tipping point helped us to get a grant with HP to transform our um, IT infrastructure. And, and our servers were old, our desktops were old, it was time for us to renew. And we did, we got the grant and implemented it. Now, but it was a matter of five years to go again through again that cycle, mm -hmm. right? And we did an analysis, a SWOT analysis of our institution, and we are located in a floating zone. Now, at the same time, we identify the old service to the, for that community is crucial. So, we need to improve our, our recovery time in, in a case that something uh, goes wrong. But if we have our servers in our building, and it's under the floating sun, and we don't understand anything around technology, how can we actually play that crucial role for the community when they need it the most? So that's why we engage a, the, the, the corporate partners, because that's what they do, right? They have their own business, they understand the importance of technology in their, in, their, in their mission, and they have resources, they invest to understand what is the IT plan for the next five, 10 years for their business. So they have resources and they have some thinking that we can use for our own organizations. Sometimes they see us as a nonprofit, as a place for you to go and, and help the poor providing food or volunteering as a tutors, but they, they have more uh, resources that we can benefit, but they don't understand what those opportunities are. You know, marketing, they have sales, we have fundraising, mm -hmm. right? They have products or services to sell, we have a message. Uh, so really is, is a lot of the, 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 the tools that they have, they are transferable for a nonprofit. And it's our job just to be creative in how can we create those projects and make it attractive for them to come and help you. Mm -hmm because they are interested in the impact, and if you present that as a crucial step to increase impact, they might be interested. Again, that goes back to my initial comments about aligning in the, in the vision. 
if they, if they care about what you're trying to do, that if they have the same the reasons to help you are the same reasons that you, what you're doing that work, then there's an alignment to perhaps partner and, and engage them mm -hmm. and help you do that. Which is relevant for whatever size organization you may be. Agree. Okay. So think about around you. You know, there's a lot of resources around you. Mm -hmm. uh, the local business chamber of commerce is, is a good place to go, get to know people there, understand, ask for a business directory, understand what are your challenges as marketing, as technology, as HR, as you mentioned it. Look who's around you and, and start trying to reach out to them. I use LinkedIn a lot. To if as a company that I want to find out or a foundation or I just go there and type the name of the company and I see my network who is connected to that and I start trying to get, can you make the, an introduction to that person? And you start finding your ways to get to the company that you want to have a conversation. So. Good. But you have a really fun local partnership with the baseball team. Can you talk about that a little oh, bit? Because that's a great, yeah. I, I didn't even know that it existed. So there's a, a semi-pro, is it? Or is it's it? This, yeah, uh, it's a semi-pro baseball local team. And everything that's happening around us is what we call the Trump effect. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of things, the good and bad. And the good is there are some people that are not aligned with the values that this new administration has. And they are willing to do more. And so they are asking us, in addition to give you money, what else can I do to support that community that's being impacted by these new policies. So the local, you know, we have multiple uh, uh, inquiries from musicians. You know, they develop a song for us. You know, they say, hey, I want to help you. In addition to give you money, what else can I do? I say, well, why you don't express the values that you think you have in this county has through a song? And they did it. And we have a beautiful song that's in a YouTube channel. And that, that song has created opportunities for us in other areas that we didn't imagine, right? We couldn't, we don't have an art program, so how can we connect with that uh, community? In Marine County, there's a lot of musicians and people that love art, and that song actually allowed us to have conversations with them. Mm -hmm. and, and we we went to, uh, as a result of that, we actually organized an event in a gallery, and, and we went there, and it was just a, an opportunity to reflect back what was happening and recognize that our families they are living at risk. And it was an opportunity to bring people from the Muslim community, from the Jewish community, from the Latino community, and have a moment of reflection. We were not expecting any dollars out of that. It was just a way for us to express. But somebody uh, got excited and gave us a $35,000 check after that. Uh -huh. right? Because they, again, the Trump effect, there's people that are being affected by that. Same thing with the, the baseball team they reach out to us and say, hey, we want to have uh, something around it. And what we do is we just give ideas. And we have this concept around my immigration story. And if you want, you can build this immigration story through your baseball players because some of them are from Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico. So there's already some immigration there, and, and they love that. So they're going to have every night, they're going to uh, um, name the, the night for a particular country and the players are gonna share the immigration story, and they invite us to go and have a big event to celebrate Canal Alliance, and we're gonna be part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, the, the game schedule that they give away to 35,000 people in the county. Uh, so it's, it's, those are the opportunities that are there for us that we, you know, again, thanks to what's happening around us, we're just trying to capitalize on those opportunities. So that's what we're gonna have. What's the name of the baseball team? Pacifics. Pacifics. Uh, Pacifics. San Rafael Pacifics. Yes. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, so as a sort of build on that, are there resources that you'd recommend folks in the audience check into or think about? Um, because you're talking about partnerships that are very much about the sustainability of your organizations and the back end of the, the machine that you have to operate. Are there resources that you folks have that are available to non-grantees or where would you recommend people go if they want to think more about this and get more information? Um, yeah, I mean, so I think from a, I mean, I think you probably all know this. I think from a, from a technology standpoint, a lot of our partners um, that give our grantees services have kind of publicly available. So Box, Dropbox, Salesforce, they all, you can, Microsoft, they all have 
programs that you can get um, licenses for free for nonprofits as well as um, kind of implementation support services. So I think that those are actually far more available than people know. We always tell them that you do a very not as good job as you could do marketing those services and those product donations. Um, from a like from our workshop standpoint, um, I'm, I would imagine you all are mostly familiar with Compass Point. I mean, there's a strong series there. Um, and then I think also from a resource perspective, and I think Omar mentioned this as, you know, it used to be that you'd really get your partnership with, through like the CEO or the C-suite people and that now it's often through the employees. I would really um, encourage people to think about who's on who's on your board, who are, who are some of your major donors, who are volunteering with you, and the connections that they have on like where basically their employer, because there's so much opportunity that can come from that. And I think a lot of um, a lot of companies, particularly in the tech sector, are doing a lot of grassroots um, efforts to engage their employees. And so an employee can sponsor whether it's a donation, um, whether it's a product donation, or um, getting a, a group of their colleagues together to volunteer um, and, and rally around fundraising as well, as well as a matching gift. So I think really um, thinking kind of small, I guess, but like the individual networks that you have and, and the connections that they can have to services, because I think particularly now, um, those employees can be really, really helpful. Yeah. 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 Any other resources you'd point people to, Omar? I don't know if there is any uh, volunteer center or volunteer management center where you are located. That's a great resource to go. Um, we do have one in, in Marin County, and we leverage all the resources that they have, connections. But we also just use the simple tools like Google Maps, put yourself and start doing some search nearby and try to find businesses. You know, Sometimes we need graphic designers mm -hmm. and we just put graphic designers around your business and you oh, I didn't know there was a graphic designer two blocks from here. And start using that and then you go to LinkedIn and mm -hmm. type who you know that is connected to that company. So all those tools that are available are free. It's really just leveraging the technology to actually get um, access to resources that you need. So Link, LinkedIn also has now, I mean, a lot of you probably know this, the, um, LinkedIn, there's a way to put on your profile, like causes that, you, like, ca causes that you're interested in, but then also if you're, if you're interested in providing kind of skilled volunteering, there's a way to go search and say, okay, I need a graphic designer, and then it can pull up profiles of people that want to give free graphic designing, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Great. Well, um, anything else you would add and any places else that people should be looking? Or I mean, the Foundation Center actually has resources mm -hmm. as well in the database and in the library. Um, and it's worth checking those out, but um, is there anything else? That I would just say just build relationship with the business chamber of commerce close mm -hmm. to you. Um, there's a lot of the resources there. So people want to help, they don't know how. Help them understand what the opportunities are. Mm -hmm. And again, if you just go and ask, you know, if you are lucky to get access to an interview with any staff member in that company, ask them what are the values of the company, or do, or do a research before that meeting, and then just present yourself as the solution for their problems, right? Uh, if they want to have an impact in, in, in the community around education, well, leverage that, that angle and make that connection say, I'm here to offer you that help. Provided you really are. Exactly. <laughs> and that really is going to help you with your direct programming exactly. and I'm work. Here, I'm, help, I'm here to help you achieve your goals, you know, making it easy for you. Yeah. So. so it sounds like you get very explicit with people, like, why are you doing this? What's in it for you as a company or an individual? Is, is the only way to engage? That was yeah. me or that was a question? Yeah, yeah. both of you, <laughs> actually. It has helped us bring good partners as mm -hmm. a result of it. Because there are some people that maybe, there are some people that are uncomfortable with um, immigrants that are not documented. I'm okay, I mean, I'm not here to judge that, but I need people that feel very comfortable working with them, because that's what we do. So if you don't come and be straight in that from the beginning, it's not gonna work that relationship. Yeah, is there anything you would add to that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in the name partnership, right? There are, of course, corporations are going to have needs that they're trying to hit, whether it's their public relations or their employee engagement or whatever it is. Of course, that's going to be right. And that's going to be, whatever that is, is going to be emphasized differently for different companies. Um, and so if you can't be explicit about that, you don't know if it's going to be um, a strong partnership unless you know you're actually meeting their needs and they can actually meet yours. So, I mean, it's like oversimplifying it a little bit, but... Um, I think, again, it gets to this power dynamic. You're, as, as nonprofits, we need to be, in my opinion, more um, direct about what we have to offer, but also like how, um, 
what, what needs we actually need met and not have it be kind of this um, one direction chase to get resources in the door. Good, great. Well, that's a great segue. I want to encourage anybody who has questions um, to come on up to the podium mic here. Um, and don't be shy. This is a great opportunity to, to get some really insightful advice. So, and if there's anybody online, please bring them on over. Um, so, any questions? So, Rachel, I yeah. will have another resource that people can go Oh, yeah. Share. Oh, go ahead. Share it. Um, if you are close to a local university or community mm -hmm. college, a schools like business schools, they have like a semester projects and just get to know the teacher there and say, hey, I have a semester project for you. So what you have to do is if you need to develop a marketing plan or anything, make sure that you've created like a project base for six weeks and then you can actually be going to have a group of six to eight people working for you for that time of day. Yeah. yeah, actually, both Haas Business School at Berkeley and Stanford Business School have formal programs that you can apply to. You can go check it out on their mm -hmm. websites. Plus, they have undergrad programs where they'll do just mm -hmm. that. So have you taken advantage of local schools yes. doing? Yes. Dominican, Dominican University mm -hmm. is our university, local university there. And we have a strong relationship with the business school. Uh -huh. um, when I have projects, you know, it, it's like a project management. So you have to provide... Uh, all the support around that project, but then you have six, eight smart people working for you um, with, with clear outcomes you know, uh -huh. in, in a particular time frame. So it's been useful? useful? Very useful, very useful. Great, that's great. Do yeah. you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thank you all, great resources. Um, and Kelly, you know, you had mentioned so, some of the feedback you've given to co companies that say, okay, we're gonna bring 50 volunteers to go hand out. Um, toys and things like that, and um, for for those of us who are come from nonprofits that are not so um, site specific, they're more like um, you know that work on on kind of a broader level, so providing services to say like artists or other or other um, communities. That it's not like a place you can just go and show up and mm -hmm. hand something out. Um, it's difficult to get into that volunteer door because what I've noticed is when I've tried to go through that channel, and you're right, they all, they're all trending towards that. I've been looking at constantly at every single portfolio of the, in the region. They're like, what do you have for our volunteers? And that's mm -hmm. the first thing in the door. And unless you, can, unless you can have them march their employees down 10 at a time, um, it's very hard to, to make the case for volunteering when they don't have that numbers and they don't have that photo opportunity. Mm -hmm. So how do you, um, when you say, when you hear some feedback that says, well, you know, we really want to be able to hand something out. We really want to be able to be able to send the photographer there. And it doesn't sound like that's the fit. Um, how do, for organizations that don't really meet that, those, um, those photo op needs, how do you, how do you kind of, argue back to the companies and say, hey, this is a value and um, this is a reason you should volunteer and connect with us, um, you know, when it's not so obvious and direct uh, and immediate, immediately gratifying, I guess you can say. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if, a, if a company is looking for a photo opportunity and you don't have a site and clients where they can get that, Again, don't be afraid to say no. The answer is we don't, we, we can't meet that need. But what you can say is the different th needs that you might have. And I would say, in particular, the companies that we've worked have been far more interested when it really comes down to it in skilled volunteering opportunities. So someone from your marketing team helps develop a marketing plan or, um, you know, someone from the IT team like help, d does kind of regular ongoing um, volunteering to help with the IT whether it's, you know, we do, um, we have organizations that do mock interviews, the various ways to plug in, but I think that, that that skill volunteering, to be honest, we have found as actually far more appealing to companies um, um, because it's just a, a, a more satisfying way for their employees to engage. But that being said, if, if, you know, if someone really says they want a photo opportunity with 20 of their people, we tell our grantees all the time, if that's not going to work for you, just say no. Um, there, in that... Um, often won't lead to that much of a benefit for the nonprofit anyway. So just kind of weigh that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why don't you come over here and ask it so the online oh, audience can hear it? <laughs> it's a big commitment. Um, the question is, it is a statement. Um, I just wanted to speak about how, how important and effective it is to be creative mm -hmm. in your approach. 
and um, you know all everything that you're saying is, is terrific and what kept coming back to me was something I heard um, that my twin sister did she used to be uh, development director for St. Vincent de Paul unfortunately she passed away in August however um, she was she spent a lot of time in the office but also at the shelter and St. Vincent de Paul I think runs the largest homeless shelter one of the largest in the area and she would go to the shelter and see the people lining up at night hoping to get a bed or, or to get something to eat and she said what about changing this environment for an afternoon or for an evening so she approached a local uh, orchestra mm -hmm. I think it was a, it was a small it wasn't symphony it wasn't Michael Tilson Thomas but it was a small group they wanted to do something and they wanted to come and serve meals but she said I have a better idea why don't you bring your your instruments stand at the door and play your favorite pieces as the people are arriving just to kind of brighten the atmosphere and they're like you think they would really want to hear that yeah so she came and they set them up and people were like what's going on once the music started the, you could just she said the the mood of the place just changed so beautifully you would close your eyes and feel like you were standing at symphony hall and what was really nice was that a lot of the people who were homeless who had you know just had a a turn in lives that took them in a different direction were able to come up and say you know I used to play tuba you know or I played the violin or I you know and I stopped because I fell in hard times and and just to be able to connect with those musicians and those musicians were so happy that mm -hmm. they did it once a quarter they would come back and just stand there and play and I just thought that was one of the most beautiful things my sister had ever arranged it was because of her creativity and she and I because we're identical twins we have this thought like why the hell not as long as the police don't chase you <laughs> do it you know but but yeah it's just you know being creative and thinking outside you know we all have that innate creativity or you work with people who have that innate creativity and don't be afraid to step outside the box because you made it with something really beautiful thank you thank you now I have to um, one of the things that's coming clear to me, and I, I just wonder if there's anybody in the audience who has questions around this, is that you're encouraging people, nonprofits, to think about themselves as businesses and that they have operations they have to maintain. And that's something I think it's a hard switch for a lot of nonprofits to realize that, like any business, a corporate, right. that they have, they have marketing, they have IT, they, all this, and there's ways to, to affect their own bottom lines by thinking in, in that way. Yeah, and I think it's also kind of, I mean, we say this both with clients and it extends to organizations, but it's coming from like an asset mentality instead of a deficit mentality, right? I mean, nonprofits have a lot to offer and th there's a partnership. Corporations want to work with nonprofits for a reason and so really thinking about, A, what you need, right? What, what, what From a business perspective, definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. we that is a big thing that Tipping Point tries to do is help um, nonprofits get the services that are often taken for granted or people don't want to fund or whatever it is, but then also um, thinking about it very much from an asset mentality, I would say. That's great. Great. Um, you have a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Becca. I work with a nonprofit called Script Ed. Um, and I was interested, we have kind of a lot of authentic, like skilled volunteering opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and Kelly, you were talking about uh, the education for companies around, you know, actually costs us a lot in terms mm -hmm. of time and money. Um, so, how do we go about educating companies about making that matching gift? Mm -hmm. And what have you seen that's success successful there? <clears throat> um, I, I, again, call me out if I'm making this oversimplified, but I, I think what we've really seen successful is just very direct conversations about it. So um, um, we have coached, and I think some of our grantees have been successful in saying this, this actually costs, you know, breaking out. This is what it costs us. That, that, you know, we have to plan this, and then our staff is doing this, and actually saying what the cost of the event is, and just being very direct and having that um, sometimes awkward conversation. Um, and we also have organizations that have actually developed what their volunteer opportunities are or their corporate engagement opportunities in a menu. And so you have that right off the bat and can say, okay, great. Twitter, you're right down the door, thank you, right down the street, thank you so much for wanting to get involved with us. Here are the different ways you can get involved. And that also starts you from a place where you've already done a lot of pre-thinking around what your actual needs are. Um, so we, we coach a lot of our organizations to have that kind of at the ready. So when they go into that conversation, you have some options. And to be honest, it's really impressive that you've put so much thought into that and can be um, sort of on top of it um, from the get-go. Um, and charge for it. And yeah. 
And then with all of those, yeah, they're usually prices, to be honest. I mean, it is actually like a menu with attached um, prices. Now, I will be honest, some corporations that find that very unappealing. Um, and again, I just really advocate for having an on honest conversation around the why of it. Um, but I think for the most part, the, the honesty and directness is appreciated. Obviously, you're going to have some companies that are going to say, no, we're not going to do that because this nonprofit down the door is going to let us do it for free. And that's fine. Let them go next door. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, um, I know you mentioned. Um, uh, I know you mentioned a little bit about the tech companies and like how to get your foot in the door, mm -hmm. and kind of how the trend has been like slowly moving up with them. But like, how would you suggest if they don't have a philanthropy program or they don't give their, you know, services for free? Like, how do you suggest getting in the door? For what? Getting in the door to do like, what? Just. Um, well, we're doing a big cause marketing campaign mm -hmm. um, where Habitat for Humanity, mm -hmm. and um, we are trying to get our foot in the door um, specifically in Redwood City tech companies. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some of them do have some philanthropy programs, some of them don't. Um, so, is there like kind of like who to contact? Like, more would you say marketing is more like a thing to do, or HR? Hmm. He has a LinkedIn. He has a LinkedIn. His LinkedIn yeah, strategy. Been, yeah. I, I, for us, his work is really finding in a person that works for that company. Especially, they don't have a clear, yeah. um, they don't have information clear about the philanthropy strategies mm -hmm. and how they invest. Many companies they actually have one in place. They will share the information somehow in their websites, but if they don't have it, I will, for us has been successful just going and finding an employee there yeah. and mm -hmm. have that conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree. And also, to be honest, like if if companies don't have a philanthropy program or they don't have a public, like I would probably not spend yeah. too much time trying to go after them unless you have an employee, an in with an employee. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times companies have things that aren't public because <laughs> for a reason they don't yeah. want people, you know. And so if it comes from an employee, you could have a lot more luck. Um, but I mean, right now there's so many companies that do have yeah. have programs, and if it's a good fit, I would focus my energy there for yeah. sure. And you're like you also are saying that um, if they do give like box, they give kind of their services, and mm -hmm. that's a good way to indicate whether they're philanthropic, right? Um, I mean, it's just a different way of having. A yeah, program. I mean, I think companies are philanthropic in a variety of ways. So some yeah. some have um, giving programs where they give grants and yeah. dollars, and others where they give services. Sometimes they do both. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, I think making sure to do do the research and then yeah. just focusing on ones that are that have programs that meet the needs that you're specifically looking for, as opposed to trying to like change your mind. It's, yeah. it's going to be a lot more effort yeah. okay. <laughs> to start something. Um, also, I think a lot of companies have budding programs, and so if you can get in with um, with employees, you might um, you know there might be something there that's just not like fully blown out in public yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Did you have questions? No. Can you add I, come up to this? Yeah, I had the same question um, actually about a point of contact. Um, so I don't know if, if you have an additional answer, but I'm I don't want to ask my contacts to um, ask in with their corporations until I know that I want to work with that corporation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ask my donors to do that yeah. um, unless I'm I'm certain that I want to pursue something. And the websites will have some information, but not enough and the ones I've looked into for me to really feel like I can do enough due diligence. And they don't say list the point of contact that says, hey, call me if you want to learn more about money. No, they don't. They really don't. <laughs> so um, so I do. I still, I'm still kind of left with the same question. I'm, I, I don't want to use my, my donor resources for that until I'm sure I'm ready. I want to do some more research about the company because um, I, we don't, we're not set up to do volunteer days, and I'm not going to start a program right. to do that. So I need to ask those questions and do that research. And I don't want to call the marketing volunteer person <laughs> Or unless that's the right person, and and sometimes they don't even list that. So I, I mean, do you, if if do you have any other thoughts about that? I think you've probably answered it, but if you do, yeah, I mean, I would say also a lot of the research you can do with with among the fellow nonprofits. So if you if you haven't heard that a company has given whatever you're looking for to other nonprofits, it's probably because they're not giving money. it. <laughs> okay, okay. So I mean, if you don't honestly, like if you don't know that, like let's let's say LinkedIn, because we know they give a lot of money, so that's safe. Um, uh, if LinkedIn hasn't given money to any nonprofit that you know of, like chances are that's not your best bet to go down that 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 road, right? Um, I mean, the, when organ when companies are giving, you know about it. 
Um, and so I would I would do a lot of research on the nonprofit side first, um, and then. I mean, I, I think of it almost like when you're, you're when you're interviewing for a job before you actually go in the door and have real interviews, you do so so much inter informational interviewing. So when you think about you don't want to use a donor or a board member to make that ask, change the ask, right? If you're just trying to get information, you're just trying to learn about it. I mean, there's so much value that comes from educating yourself on that way. I would I personally would use that that um, ask to kind of get in the door if you think that there's something there, just to try to get information, and then that often. Um, kind of softens the process as well because you can go in and say, hey, I just want to know more about what LinkedIn is. I don't know. I don't know why I'm picking on LinkedIn, but I just want to know more about what you're doing. I want to learn about how you're engaged in the community and how we could potentially work together without saying like, hey, I need $10,000 <laughs> right now, you know? I mean, it just, it's, it's relationship building. So um, I think if you have an in, I would, I would use your asks to get that even just to start the conversation for me. You can always turn it down if you don't want to work with them. That ever got to it. That would be a really good problem to have. <laughs> so I'm just going to follow up on that question. Can, as well. I'm going to follow up on that question as well. Um, specifically, following up on the LinkedIn example too. Um, we have uh, a lot of volunteer opportunities, and they're not necessarily skilled volunteer opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm at Habitat too, so it's a lot of. It really is a good photo op volunteer opportunity, which is great. But um, we've been having. I feel like we. It goes up and down between providing that opportunity and then also getting a grant opportunity or a donation opportunity with that and then oftentimes not as well even with the same company um, and sometimes when you have a contact at a company like LinkedIn or a tech company that you know gives money and you know has a philanthropic program um, the person you're talking to sometimes just doesn't know about that mm -hmm. and like I'll, I'll make you know, general asks in that direction um, about either, you know, what information does that contact have about that or um, could they connect me with the person who does and I've gotten really mixed results with that. Um, and I am wondering if the thing to do is to really encourage the contact you have to learn more or to encourage them to connect you with the person in that position that, that works more directly with the, the giving. Um, what would you recommend? Hmm. I mean, definitely, I would definitely recommend getting connected to the, the yeah. there's so many, and every company is different where it lives. Um, sometimes it lives within marketing, sometimes it lives in with legal. I mean, there's so many different places, So, and especially in bigger companies, um, to go learn more about that opportunity. It's just not realistic. So I'd definitely figure out a way to get um, to to the place where it's actually housed. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, one thing particularly particularly with a, with a nonprofit like Habitat for Humanity that does have such popular volunteering opportunities. Um, I mean, you could think about having that be one of your criteria so that companies um, kind of know going into it that the, the financial contribution is a piece of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've had it. And that's, that's required, hard. Required, and then we've okay. gone to not required. Yeah. We've kind of gone back and forth and had success on both sides, but it, right. thank you. I mean, you have a huge asset. Like, yeah. there, there are a lot of companies that want that, like, mm -hmm. team building, yeah. and, it's, and it's an activity that actually is contributing to the real work that you're doing. You know, it's not ancillary. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure this actually answers your direct question, but I, I would think about making it um, a, a requirement. Yeah. And it also sounds like, Omar, that you've talked, you've thought about it more long term, that you yeah. get these volunteers and you really cultivate them. Yeah. Um, I would just suggest to add the, well, my, my own personal criteria when I go in and in, in, in test how serious that company is around social impact. Mm -hmm. The fact that the employees don't know anything about what are the, the strategies, that's not a good sign. Yeah. yeah. Because the companies, they really are serious about that. They is part of what the the value proposition that they offer to the employees, everybody will know. Yeah. Um, so when I go and people say, I have no idea what is the philanthropy strategies here or the social impact, mm -hmm. I just move to the next company. Okay. So okay. that's what I do. Good. Any other questions? I'm guessing there are people in the audience thinking about companies they want to approach. That you Are there any problems that you can, you want to try to problem solve up here with a question? Yeah, come on up here to the podium, please.
So um, we do have the Salesforce grant mm -hmm. um, for the 10 nonprofit licenses. Mm -hmm. And um, my understanding is that Salesforce does, they do the 1%. 1% of tech, 1% of money, and 1% of something else. I can't remember what it employee is. Employee time, I think. What is it? Employee time. Oh, yeah, employee time, right. So, um, but my understanding is that Mark Benioff is the decider mm -hmm. on these things. And I'm, um, this has been similar to my experience with other companies, too, that there is, like, a very high-level decider mm -hmm. that needs to sign off on things. So um, I'm wondering what you think about that. What I, what I think about? Just any thoughts you might have about it. I mean, do you know, is that true? Or Mark Benioff is definitely not the decider in terms of where, um, where product and time oh, yeah. and grants go. They, I mean, Salesforce, um, Mark Benioff established that 1% model, and, and it's kind of propagated around to many tech companies using it, but um, Salesforce has an entire .org foundation with the head of the foundation, and, and that group of people are making those decisions. Um, they clearly communicate very closely with Mark Benioff, and it, I mean, ultimately, yes, it's, it's the Salesforce brand, um, but there's an entire um, professional organization, like foundation, that are, that are doing the, the giving now through that model. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Kevin and I'm with Spark. Mm -hmm. We are a workplace-based mentoring program. Mm -hmm. And we have definitely found that it's employee engagement that really can drive philanthropy at some corporations. And I'm, one of the mechanisms by which they do that is kind of a dollars for doers model where mm -hmm. they'll, they'll match employee volunteer hours with funding. Mm -hmm. And one challenge around that is that you then have to get your volunteers to log their hours on the corporate <laughs> side. I'm wondering if this is a problem that anyone else is experiencing and if you all have thoughts about kind of creative ways to engage volunteers who are already giving their time to give this one last step and, and wow. kind of log their hours. That's yeah. important. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a system to track the hours in, but the potential with Salesforce going back to the, the, they have, the Salesforce has the NGOC. We're using NGOC, the platform that was built in Salesforce. Mm -hmm has the capacity to create a portal that you will go with a username and password and add your own hours. Mm -hmm. and, and you can take it from just a simple report to really a, a page mm -hmm. that they can re report back to you the impact of those hours, economic impact. So there is a contribution for the person entering because hey, by working 10 hours means this financial impact for the organization and it means the, these students mm -hmm improve their grades. And then they keep the volunteers engaged with the impact and get them motivated on entering the information. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. So we use a mix of tracking in Excel, tracking in Salesforce, and, and it's a struggle that we have. So you then, you keep track of the volunteers' hours and then report that back to the company? That's right, okay. by that. I think also creating any type of um, like competition or or something to get to get the employee like get, to get the mentors or employees excited about tracking their hours and and you know the recognition of you know in any given month of someone who's like logged the most hours that kind of thing like recognizing both the time that's gone into it but then if you get them excited and proud and competitive about that then hopefully they'll be better about um, tracking for the financial contribution as well. I, I find the volunteer management platforms and companies are pretty competitive and um, also it's also where you might find some new um, volunteers you haven't seen before. Can you recommend the ones that you find to be most useful? Like, um, you know, we have things listed on Benevity and uh, I think Volunteer Match. And then we could do it in our own CRM, um, you know, and like you said, you know, you, you track your stuff on the own. I can't imagine trying to get my board to track their volunteer hours. It's just like, it, it, it's, it, that's a long ask. Um, and plus, like, we're, we're a very tight organization, but we have at least, like, 100 volunteers at any given time. And um, we've never tracked them before, ever. So uh, it's just a change in culture that will take a long time to do. But I was thinking, like, well, if it's through one of these companies and it's, it's initiated as a policy, 
um, maybe one of these other platforms will do it and these other kind of um, volunteer software slash recruitment companies. And I don't know if you've worked with any of them and you find any of them better than others. Like, you know, what's the weight with some of these? Um, there's like probably like 10 out there that yeah. are pretty common. Um, so we, we, I don't have that much to say on this because to be honest, we, we sit in kind of this intermediary situation and so we don't, we connect companies often to, to grantees or whatever volunteer opportunities, but we're not super engaged. That being said, we work with Volunteer Match right now to run a volunteer portal, and so all of our grantees can place their um, volunteer opportunities um, on a portal that then like house essentially our 45 organizations. Um, we are also, I will say, exploring creating a, an, um, a customized portal for that need as well. Um, I know some of the companies that we work with uh, do use Benevity. You're right, because there's so many. What gets hard is, like, bringing it all together for, like, there's a little bit of a disconnect between each. This company uses this program, and this company uses that program. Nonprofits are using a different one. So they're, they're, there's an opportunity for a solution there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? I use Volunteer Match, and it's been really good. Any final question? Are we all good? All right, well, we're just about at time, so. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, guys.